is my 1952 US Army M38A1. Still has a few things I need to finish before it's fully complete. This was uh, after it was retired from the Army, it was used by the Civil Defense Force as a Jeep to fight fires, and it was actually an orange color. Um, I went ahead and tried to repaint it. It's not a show quality paint job, this, or a show quality restoration. It's actually a, uh, I kind of restored it so it's drivable. Uh, the paint job, in terms of the marking of the stuff, it's a 52 Jeep, but I decided to do something different and paint it in markings used in 1957. Um, that's why I put the National Guard markings on it, because I wanted to kind of do a later in life. Um, everybody likes to do the real popular uh, military units on their vehicles, but I decided to go with some of the lesser known ones. And since the National Guard probably would have received the Jeep a couple years after the Army had it, that's why I went with the 57 paint job. Um, the back seat was removed by the Civil Defense Force. I, it looks like they had some kind of a water pumping equipment in there. I'm debating whether or not to install a new back seat. I kind of like the additional cargo space. Um, still has all the original data plates in the gauges. Well, here is the power plant of this Jeep. It's the uh, Hurricane engine. It's, it actually replaced the uh, World War II Go Devil engine. It's uh, four cylinders, uh, 72 horsepower. It actually has 12 more horses than the, uh, its World War II counterpart. The engine is mostly stock. There's a few small modifications that have been made to it. Um, this fuel line here is not the original fuel line. It used to have a, a steel one that would come from the fuel pump up into the carburetor. Um, that was missing when I got the Jeep, so I've modified it to where it's a, uh, a rubber fuel line um, with the fuel filter attached. The fuel filter in the gas tank was completely rotted away, so I decided to install one up here. I'm probably going to convert this back to a steel fuel line. The only reason I haven't so far is because I wanted to keep this rubber line on while I worked any bugs out of the engine. That's why I've got this clear hose here so I can see if the fuel pump is actually getting any gas. Um, the fording equipment must have been removed by the Civil Defense Force. The valves and stuff are actually still on this Jeep. I can reattach the, uh, the cables up to them. Uh, it is missing one of the valves down here though. and has been replaced with this piece. Um, I can actually find the re replacement part online. Um, I'm debating whether or not to do that since I don't plan on taking the vehicle underwater. This vehicle is 24 volts instead of 12. Um, it actually has two batteries instead of one. Um, and a lot of the electrical components are really overly built. I mean, look at the size of the alternator and generator. And a lot of the connections are sealed so they can be waterproof. Though at some point somebody replaced the spark plugs with... Um, Looks like ones that are rubber and they're not steel and sealed like they should be. Okay, we are now sitting inside the M38A1. One of the first things that people always seem to ask me is why does it have three shift levers? Well, this first one is actually used to change what gear the Jeep is in. Uh, this middle one is actually to switch between whether it's in four-wheel drive or two-wheel drive. And this third gear shift is to select whether the is in low or high. Okay. A um, few of the things that aren't stock in my M38A1 are is this battery cutoff. This was added at some point. Um, it's generally a modification people made so the batteries don't drain out because of a short somewhere or if somebody leaves the lights on. Um, I think this was installed back when the Civil Defense Force owned this Jeep because it was the same color as the rest of the Jeep. Uh, 
this, let's see, turn this on and it adds battery power. And at one point the uh, ignition switch was replaced with this toggle switch. It, this is not stock. Uh, the original toggle switch, or excuse me, ignition switch looked like this battery switch down here. In fact, this may have actually been the ignition switch and somebody, rather than go out and buy another one, just took the one that was used for the ignition and placed it on the battery um, cutoff switch. Another unique feature about these old military vehicles is um, a lot of people don't realize nowadays that at one point vehicles were, their windshield wipers were not powered by electricity. They were actually powered by the vacuum produced from the motor. Um, these are actually called vacuum wipers, so the faster you would go, the slower the wipers would work. Um, and if for some reason the vacuum system fails on this particular vehicle, you can actually do the wipers by hand. This actually isn't very fun in a rainstorm uh, when your wipers fail and you have to use them manually. Another unique feature of this particular vehicle, well it's actually common in a lot of the military vehicles, but in terms of the civilian market, it's, I haven't seen them before, is this really strange looking light switch control. Um, default, the vehicle when you turn it on and drive it doesn't have any brake lights or anything. You actually have to remember to set this thing to uh, stop light to just get the brake lights. And when you want to drive at night, it's a good idea to set it to service drive so you have headlights. And then you can set the uh, panel light to on or off. Or It's actually, there's a dim switch. That's bright and that's dim and that's off. And then at night it also has the option of driving with blackout lights, which I wouldn't recommend, but in the military it actually served a purpose to kind of limit your visibility at night by using the minimal amount of light to drive with. Um, it's not a good idea to probably try to drive on the highway like that. Now let's talk about what some of the other uh, switches on this and levers do on this vehicle. This actually controls the forwarding system. You pull it out and it would pull those two cables that I showed you earlier that were disconnected and it would change the uh, or set up the vehicle so it can run on the forwarding system. Um, again, like I said, this was actually the ignition switch. It was replaced with the toggle switch at some point. This is the throttle lock. Um, Basically, you pull it out and it locks the throttle into certain positions. Some people call this a manual cruise control, but I really wouldn't recommend using it when you're driving because if you forget it's set, uh, the throttle's still going to be on if you try to slow down. Um, this is the choke. Pull it out, push it in. Works just like any other choke. Um, this is actually the glove compartment. It's actually kind of unique because most vehicles have their glove compartment on the right side. Um, it's full of a bunch of crud right now of mine, but it's actually a pretty large glove compartment for a vehicle of this size. And this switch controls the wipers on, off. Uh, you have to have the engine running for them to work. They're not electrical as I mentioned earlier. Okay, let's see if we can't get this vehicle started. On my particular M38A1, I have to turn the battery cutoff switch on to on. Flip the ignition switch on to on. Um, one thing you'll notice is there's no key on this vehicle. You actually have to start it with a, a button on the floorboard, which um, turns on the starter. Uh, another thing to check is if it's in neutral. I always hold down the clutch just in case. Um, on colder days or when the engine hasn't been running, uh, you can you should pull the choke out. I'm not going to do that because I, I drove this thing about half an hour ago, so it's already warmed up. Um, let's see. Let's start this thing. And there you have it. I, the vehicle's running.